and then always she asked me this afternoon she said are you nervous and I said there has never been a time that I, I was ordained in this church in 1981 1981 temple ordained me when I took my first church and she says why are you still nervous before you preach and I said because it's a tremendous responsibility I said, you've got, you've got God's people that come to hear something from the Lord. You, you never know what somebody's going through. And so it's a tremendous responsibility to make sure that you've done all you can do. And I have. I've done all I can do. Uh, I've sought the Lord's face, spent time in prayer. Uh, I've never learned how to preach. And I'm too old to try tonight. So unless the Lord touches me, uh, there won't be much preaching done. I pray he gives me liberty to share with you what's on my heart. Look in Psalms 22. Go to the 22nd Psalm and then Isaiah 63. Psalms 22 and then Isaiah chapter 63. Uh, <clears throat> preacher was talking about... Uh, getting a message from everything. I'm the world's worst, brother. And this message came that quick, the thought. And then I had to research it from something that I've seen on television, uh, about one minute of it, and uh, the Lord gave me a message. Isn't that something? Or a thought for a message. Now, this is very familiar to you. Uh, let, me, uh, let me get my specs out. Spirit's willing, but the flesh is weak. I have to remind myself I can't see anymore. Psalms chapter number 22. This is, I'm going to read verse 1 through verse number 6. Then I'm going to jump down and read verse number 14. And then only three verses in Isaiah 63. Psalms 22, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? O oh my God, I cry in the daytime, but thou hearest not, and in the night season, and am not silent, but thou art holy, O oh thou that inhabitest the praises of Israel. Our fathers trusted in thee, they trusted, and thou didst deliver them. They cried unto thee, and were delivered. They trusted in thee, and were not confounded. Look at verse number 6. I know you've heard this taught and preached so many times. But I am a worm and no man, a reproach of men and despised of the people. Jump down to verse 14. He said, I am poured out like water. All my bones are out of joint. Notice, please, my heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. Isaiah chapter 63 and verse 1 through 3. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from Balzra? This that is glorious in his apparel, traveling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel, and thy garments like him that treadeth in the wine fat? I have trodden the wine press alone. Of all the people, there were none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger, trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all of my raiment. My Father, I thank you tonight, Lord, for touching my heart in such a powerful, burdensome way. I've carried this message, Lord. And, and I'm so thankful that I get to get it off of my heart tonight. I can't preach. You know me better than anybody in this building unless you anoint me. Give me liberty. There'll be no preaching done. For all that may be accomplished, I'll bow my most unworthy head. I'll give you the praise for it, for it's in Jesus' name. Amen. The 22nd Psalm is uh, considered one of the Messianic Psalms. It's It's... Some people refer to it as the crucifixion psalm. 
And it's, a, it's an amazing thing when you read Psalms 22. This is a thousand years before the birth of the Lord Jesus. This is a Psalm of David, but clearly it's not about David. Uh, it speaks of the Lord. You find the same verses in the New Testament in Matthew 27, 46 and Mark 15, 34. The same verses where the Lord says, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Now, in verse number 6, I, and I studied this, but, but, but something, something happened when I went through it this time that I'd never seen before. The Holy Spirit, referring to the Lord Jesus Christ when he was on the cross, said, I am a worm. What a thing, man. I mean, what a thing to, to refer to yourself hanging on the cross as a worm. So I've done some work on this word worm. Uh, the Hebrew that it was translated from, now don't look at me like I'm going to try to pronounce it. Nobody pronounces Hebrew words as good as Preacher Lawson. I am amazed. I, just, I love to hear him pronounce them Hebrew words. So I'm not going to make a, an attempt, but it's spelled T-O-W-L-A. I didn't take Hebrew. I did take Greek, but to take Greek you had to take English. I was the only one, I believe, brother, in the whole class that failed English and made an A in Greek. <laughs> because the English they tried to teach me is not what we talk in Union County. <laughs> so I'm not going to try to pronounce this word, but in the, if you've got a Hebrew lexicon, you can look it up. The word worm is the Hebrew word, T-O-W-L-A. The scientific word is the cocos worm. In the Middle East, it's referred to as the crimson grub. So why would the Bible refer to the Lord Jesus as a worm? My. That cocos worm or the crimson grub only lays its eggs one time in its lifetime. And when that little worm, and it's only about the size of a pea, and it's crimson in color, and when it's ready to lay her eggs, she will attach herself to a tree, a piece of wood, and she will crawl up that piece of wood and she will form a crimson shell around her body. Now, if I get excited and leave the building, I'm not done preaching, so stay with me. She will attach herself firmly to a tree and she'll form a crimson shell around her body. And there in the darkness of that crimson shell attached to a tree, she births her babies. When she gives birth to these little ones, they're protected. They're inside this crimson shell that's firmly attached to a tree. And then she begins to nourish those babies. And when she does, they'll feed off of her body for three days. She literally gives her life for her babies. Isn't that fitting for Mother's Day? So they'll feed off of her body for three days. And then just before she dies, she does something that is so amazing. She emits from her body a crimson dye that flows out of her body. It stains the wood and it marks her babies for life. Oh, Brother Blue, you say, I feel some preaching coming on. And once she marks her babies with that crimson dye, they'll be marked forever. Amen. They can't change colors. Once their mama has marked them with that crimson dye, whoo, they're marked for eternity. They feed on her body for three days. And she dies as she emits everything that's in her. All the dye leaves her body. That crimson shell is ruptured. And that crimson stain washes those little ones back down the, the tree or the piece of wood. And on the fourth day, her head turns into her tail. And she turns into a piece of white wax. What did he say in verse 14? My heart is like wax, and that wax dries. Then it begins to flake off. 
like the manna did in Exodus chapter 15 when God uh, uh, saved his people with the manna. And that white wax begins to fall to the ground and that nourishes those little ones. My goodness. <laughs> you start to understand a little bit now why he's referred to as a worm? I found, do you know, even today, that the crimson grub is, 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 is something that to, to get the dye out of that crimson grub, it's a very expensive ordeal to do that. Do you know that they use that dye to stain the robes of the high priest? Do you know they used that dye to turn the carpet red? Some of you know where I got this message now. I watched uh, the, the Hollywood stars and starlets walk a red carpet as the lights flashed. And everybody was praising the gods of this world. And man, the Holy Spirit spoke to me and said, I want you to go back there and I want you to start working on a message about the first one to walk a red carpet. Hallelujah. <laughs> that dye from that crimson grub was used in the dye to stain the high priest robes. Isn't that, isn't that something? It, 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 that was in, in Bible days it was used for that. It was considered only for royalty. Very expensive. In the Elizabethan area, 1558, 1603, it was used to roll out for kings and dignitaries to walk. You ever wonder where that came from, the red carpet treatment? I'm going to tell you where it came from tonight. It was only royalty, only royalty was to walk on that red carpet. Keep in mind, this all started with that cocus worm in, in Psalms 22.6. That's where the dye came from originally. And it was reserved for the rich, the famous royalty. Golly, bum. In 1902, there was a railroad in New York, the New York Central Railroad. And when they opened up this railroad in the passenger cars, they took this plush red carpet and they rolled it out for the passengers. And they walked that plush red carpet to go to their individual booths or, or, or where they was going, whatever car they was going to be riding in. And that's where the old cliche started, the red carpet treatment. Isn't, isn't that something? That, and that, that, that amazes me. Amen. And I was watching it, brother. And I was watching these. Most of them infidels, uh, God denying, uh, just, I mean, everything you can imagine in Hollywood, walking a red carpet. A statement was made, and I can't think of the guy's name, but he made this statement in February of 2016. And he was talking about the stars and starlets that walked that red carpet. You know what he said? He said, that is a place that was never meant for mere mortals. That was only designed for royalty. And I thought, give me a break. You mean Lady Gag Gag can watch that and I can't? <laughs> a mere mortal. I said Gag Gag. You know who I'm talking about. She'd puke a hound off a gut wagon. But they'll walk that red carpet, buddy, that's meant for nothing but royalty, kings and dignitaries. They would roll it out on the steps leading up to the throne. I thought about all of that. And then it hit me. Holy Spirit smacked me right between the eyes and said, who was the first one to walk a red carpet? I'll tell you who it was. I'll tell you who it was. He walked away from Pilate's Hall with 39 stripes across his back. He said he could look down and his bones would stare back at him. He was beaten to a bloody pulp. And every step he took from there to Calvary, he took it in his own blood. He walked a red carpet, bless your heart, 2,000 years ago in his own blood. All the way 
from Pilate's Hall down to Via Della Rosa. And I'll never forget this, brother. I was able, this church sent me to the Holy Lands in 1988. Got to go there with Preacher Lawson. He kept, he kept saying, there, there, there's a place. If this storekeeper will let us uh, go down, there, there's a place where you can actually walk the original Via Della Rosa. I mean, Jerusalem has been built upon so many times. I think we went down 30, 40 feet, maybe even deeper. And they had lights strung up. Yeah. And we walked. Remember that, brother? Oh, yeah. We walked. Boy, I'm going to tell you, if that don't crank your tractor, your battery's dead. Yeah. Just knowing that you're walking on a place where my Savior came across yeah. and bled every drop he had for his youngins. Amen. Amen. The first one ever to walk the red carpet was royalty. Right. Amen. Amen. The first one ever to walk it was a king. And he walked it, brother, in his own blood. He walked a river of blood all the way to the cross. Amen. And at that cross, he attached himself to it. Amen. Amen. And at the cross, he birthed his children. It's where I got covered. Where'd you get covered? Yeah. And you know what? It ain't, it ain't rubbed off yet. Amen. What I got at Calvary, it's still there. Amen. You know, I was dealing. I wanted to preach on, on something else. And the Lord said, I, this is brand new, brother. You know, I used to preach a lot of revivals, and, and it was a lot different than pastoring. This brother has to have something fresh out of the oven every service, every service, every service. And preaching revivals was just a little bit different because I had a series of revival messages. And I'd lay them out before the Lord and say, Lord, which one, what do you want me to start off with? Which one? I mean, how do you want me to go here? And they were revival messages. And the Lord started working me on this. And I've been working on this thing forever. And then the preacher asked me last Sunday, can you preach Sunday night? And I said, yeah. And I thought, I know what I'm going to preach. I know what I'm going to preach. Preachers know what I'm talking about. I thought, Brother Tom, I'll go back that night, preached over at that rival, and they, and they turned the pews upside down, and they knocked holes in the wall. Yeah, I'm going to brush that and off, pray over it, and I'll preach that at Temple. And it's like the Holy Spirit said, go ahead, help yourself. Help yourself. But you'll preach it by yourself. I said, oh, no, I, no, I don't want to do that. I don't, I don't do that. And I couldn't get away from this. He referred to himself as a crimson grub. He attached himself to a tree, and there he birthed his children. He said in John chapter 6, unless you eat my flesh and drink my blood, you have no part with me. The disciples was confused. They said, Lord, what, what do you mean? I mean, you, 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 mean you, you want us to eat your flesh and drink your blood? He said, the words that I speak, their spirit and their life, just like that worm when she'd bled completely out and nothing left. And she turned into a piece of wax in the shape of a star. And even then, she fed her children. That's what he does to us tonight. He's feeding us tonight. Amen. The manna that he's dropping tonight, he's dropping it to feed his children. Amen. You say, you know what, preacher, that's... I never thought about that. Well, I didn't either. I'd never thought about it either. The first one to walk a red carpet... And he done it for me. Each drop of blood he shed for even me. But you know what? I was rejoicing over that, and the Holy Spirit said, that's not the last time he's walking it. <clears throat> that was the first time he walked it, but he's going to walk it again. And I said, you, you know what? Dewey, that's right. He is going to walk it again. He is. He's going to walk the red carpet again. The only difference, this time it won't be in his blood. The first red carpet he walked was the blood coming from his own body. But the Bible said, whoa, who is this that comes from Eden? From Edom with dyed garments from Bozra. If you're a Bible believer, you know what that is. That's the Lord Jesus Christ coming back to claim what's rightfully his. And brother, when he comes back, Woo, I, John, saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, 
And he that sat upon him was faithful and true. Amen. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. He comes back to tread out the winepress of the wrath of God. Amen. And the Bible just said that there's blood splattered on his garments. Amen. Not his blood this time. Oh no. No. He comes back to walk another red carpet. But it's the red carpet of blood the blood of the enemies of the church, the enemies of the cross, the Antichrist and his forces, this evil, filthy world we're living in. Boy, if they only knew what was coming. He's coming back. And when he comes back, he's coming back to walk a red carpet again. That excites me. How many is looking forward to the world premiere? I am. I don't want to miss that. I don't want to miss it. If I'm sitting there doing something and Shannon wants to hear something, she said, would you shut up or go in another room? <laughs> Let me tell you something. When my Savior that attached himself to a tree and walked a red carpet in his own blood for me, a filthy, low-life, stinking sinner, when he comes back to walk it again, I don't want to miss it. And as a matter of fact, I won't because I'll be with him. If you look at that real close, it says, and those that's with him, they have blood scattered, not splattered on their garment too. Isn't that something? But when he comes back the second time to walk the red carpet, he's coming back as king of kings and lord of lords. Isn't that something? If I, don't make, if I don't put a smile on your face or make you shout, your battery is dead, man. I'm telling you, that, that, that just sets my soul on fire. That just gets my heart, man. I like to shake that in the devil's face. You ever do that? I know you do it. You get a, a, a scripture and the devil will get on you and you just like to you just take it. Yeah, take that, Satan. Deal with that. I deal with people all the time. All the time, man, all the time. I've had to counsel people when I needed counsel. Any preachers ever been there? Somebody comes to you for counsel and you think, my goodness, I need somebody to counsel me. But I've never seen a time in my ministry when more and more and more people feel forsaken. They feel forsaken of God. Brother, I sat with a man of God. I, I'm telling you, I couldn't even carry his Bible. I couldn't even hold his Bible while he preached. His wife asked me to come and see him, and I sat with him. Somebody said, you jumped a rabbit. It won't run very far before I run it in a hole. I've got to say this. And I sat down with this man of God. You know what he said to me? It broke my heart. He said, preacher, God's forsaken me. I said, no. Oh, that's, so brother, that's, not, that's just not possible. That's, that's not possible. When you got marked at Calvary, it, 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 it's for eternity. And I knew some of the things he'd been through, knew what he was going through then. And I could understand why he felt that way. But the thing we have to separate is the difference between the temporal and the eternal. Listen to me. He didn't save my body. He saved my soul. Amen. And he doesn't stop life from happening and my body going through it. As a matter of fact, he said, in this world you shall have tribulation. But be of good cheer, I've overcome the world. But preacher, he's touched with the feelings of our infirmities. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely is, but it doesn't say that he takes care of all of them. He's touched. The part of you that he will never, ever, ever, ever forsake. Ever. And your body may feel forsaken. You may go through things and you feel forsaken. You feel like he's left you. I'll promise you one thing. What he saved and put inside of you is him. He will not forsake himself. And it doesn't take much. When you feel forsaken, I told this brother, I said, try something with me. You, feel, you think God's forsaken you? He said, I really do, brother. And I thought, man, this great man of God, I'd I never be able to preach as, with as much wisdom and power as he's got. And he feels forsaken. I said, 
would, would you do something with me? He said, sure. I said, oh, close your eyes. He closed his eyes. And I said, oh, amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. And I heard him start to, <laughs> I said, you see, brother, you see, your body feels forsaken, but that right there, never. He will never leave me nor forsake me, the part of me that he saved. My body's still waiting for redemption. That's not the pro that, that, that promise was never made to the body that he'd never leave it and forsake it. Our body is God's enemy. It's our enemy. The promise is to that saved soul. And man, when you're going through a desert and you think God's forsaken you, all you got to do is bow your head if you know him, just start singing something. See how long it takes for something and then they start moving around and bouncing around. And he says to you, I'll never forsake you, child. The second walking of the red carpet. That's short and sweet. That's what the Lord had on my heart. Let me tell you this. And then Brother Van's going to come. We're going we're to sing a verse invitation. For years, Mom, I don't know how long, I went to the nursing home to see my granny. I, the only time I ever missed a week is when I was away in revival preaching. And these two, these two old colored fellers, preacher, would be sitting there. I'd go over there on, on Sunday morning early and see my granny before I'd go to church. And they, they'd be sitting there in their wheelchairs. Be sitting there in their wheelchairs, waiting for a church bus to come by and pick them up. And, and they, they knew I was a preacher. And they'd sit there. And, you know, I'd, I'd walk by and just look at them and I'd say something to them. Well, you fellas look awful pretty this morning. Well, waiting on that church bus, preacher. Waiting on our church bus. And I walked in there. I was going through life. Enough said. And I went over there on that Sunday. I told the Lord all the way over there how he had forsaken me. I did. I told him all the way over there. I, how can I go see my granny and you, you've forsaken me? I walked in, there they sat. Now you'd have to see them, both of them in a wheelchair. And one of them is so bent and crippled that he, he, his head is way down here like this. Always had a smile on her face waiting for that church bus to pull up. And I just stopped and I looked at them. And one of them said, Preacher, we got a song for you. I said, Okay, let me have it. Blessed a Sure, once Jesus is mine. Man, I'm telling you, nobody can sing like black folks anyway. You know that. Man, they started singing that song, sitting in a wheelchair. I mean, as far as, as the world is concerned, they've been left there, man, forsaken. But boy, they was something inside their soul that they knew was not forsaken. They started singing. The power of the Holy Spirit came down. They started crying. I was squalling. I walked inside the door of the nursing home, and I said, Thank you, Lord. You sent them to me this morning. Didn't know they're sitting there every Sunday. I'm just sick and tired of your belly aching. It's easy to feel forsaken. Life can turn you, man, it can throw more stuff to you, and you pray, and it don't go nowhere, it seems like. It's on me to say this, preacher, because you was there, and then I'm through. A lot of people didn't know that Sharon Mahan was my sister. And when my sister passed away and her funeral was here, it shocked some folks. Me and Sharon loved each other. She called me. We talked all the time. We'd wear the phone out. We knew each other's business, what was going on. But we didn't talk a whole lot when we got in church. And so it shocked a lot of people. 
I was with my sister. She called, and she said, I want you to be here when the doctor tells me what's wrong with me. I said, okay. I went to the hospital when the doctor came in. He told Sharon, he said, well, you've got cancer in your lungs. You've got cancer in your colon. And you've got cancer in your liver. And he, he looked at my sister and he said, do you have any questions for me? Now, those of you that's ever sat with a doctor in a conference room, you know what that means. He thought that my sister would say, how much time do I have? That's what he was expecting. And Sharon said, I have no questions. And she looked at me and she said, my brother doesn't either. So if she don't, she don't want to know, I sure don't want to know. But then she started taking chemo, took two, two rounds of it. She'd call me. When she called me fat boy, she was feeling better. And she'd call and she'd say, hey, fat boy, what are you into? And I, could, I said, well, you're feeling better. You're back to the old Sharon, you know. And she well, I'm, I'm getting a good report, this, this, and this, and this. Everything was going good. And she probably told you this too, preacher. She said, you know what? She said, I'm ready to go. I'm ready to go. I'm ready to see Dad. And she said, but I want to be able to raise them two boys. And she said, the Lord has given me peace that he's not going to take me until I raised him two boys. That's what she told me. And I said, if you've got peace about that, that's, that's good. It wasn't very long after we had that conversation that I got a phone call to come to the old St. Mary's up on the hill. They said, your sister's here said her all of her organs are starting to shut down and she's not going to leave the hospital and I, I went into that room and uh, Sharon couldn't communicate with me okay she had an oxygen mask over her mouth her face and she was trying to talk and I know you heard it too brother something would rip your heart out she was trying to talk through that mask and she was just saying, Jesus, please, Jesus, please, Jesus, help me, Jesus, please. Gee, I'm just human. I don't have no cinder blocks, Brother Tom, attached to my feet to keep me from floating off into glory. And Sharon kept saying that over and over and over, and I'd go over and I held her hand, I rubbed her face, I kissed her face. She couldn't respond. She just kept saying, Jesus, please help me, help me. And I sat down, and I looked up, and I said, Lord, uh, you know, I'm not having any trouble hearing her from where I'm at. I mean, are you, you, you having any problem? You say, well, I've never been there. Just sail on. Life will take you places that you never think you'd be. And I sat there and I said, you know, I can hear her real good. You know, I can hear her. Can't you hear her? And after that, they came and told me, said, we can keep her here or we can put her in the room, keep her comfortable, and the family can go. And I said, I made all the calls. I said, you put my sister in a room. You keep her comfortable. You were sitting right there, brother. And I thought, you know what? My heart was so crushed. Seeing my little sister leave like that. And I bowed my head and I said, Lord, help me. I know you haven't forsaken me. I know you haven't forsaken her. But help me. I need something right now, Lord, in the worst kind of way. They took all of the needles and the pins and everything out. We sat there and the preacher said, look, look. And both her little old hands went up just like that from that bed. And she started reaching. The preacher said, she's reaching for somebody. <laughs> I said, yeah, you, you remember that, don't you, brother? I said, yeah, you reckon? If she's reaching for somebody, I said, I wonder if it's Jean. That was my daddy. I said, I don't know, but she's saying something that we're not seeing. I needed that. I, I needed that. And then right after that, she, her little body just went in peace. She's gone. Yeah. 
Then I lost my mom in 2019. I'm the only one left. I'm the only one in my family left. And the Lord's left me here for a reason. <sighs> See, I jumped a rabbit. I don't like doing that, brother, but I did, and I ran it. Because somebody here is sitting here tonight, and you feel totally forsaken of God. He doesn't stop life. He doesn't stop life just for us. Life is allowed to happen. And unfortunately, we're in the middle of it. But the part of you that he will never forsake is what he birthed in, in you when he was hanging on that cross as a cocos worm. Amen. That'll be there forever. And when you feel forsaken, they don't take much at all for me. Just bow your head and sing something. They don't take long. Man, you can feel him rolling around in there and the tears open up and there he is. He was there all along. All along. Brother Van, come and get us a song. My Father, I thank you. I thank you, Lord, for touching my heart with this. My, who would ever think of a message like that? Who was the first to walk the red carpet? My goodness. I wasn't there when you walked it the first time in your own blood. I wasn't there. I was there when you shed every drop of it. I was at the base of that tree on my knees when you shed every drop and you marked me for life. I was there. I was there. My father, I am looking so forward to the world premiere of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords as you walk the red carpet again and the blood of your enemies. And you sat down on the throne of your father David. What a day that will be. Even so come, Lord Jesus, even so come quickly. Let's, let's stand up and sing. I asked Brother Van if he would sing this song right here.